Good morning, everyone. This is Bassam Haddad. I am here with Professor Youssef Munayir. Uh, we are now holding our eighth teach-in on colonial narratives in the within the framework of the Gaza and Context Collaborative Teach-in series. Uh, we have um, another teaching coming up this afternoon at 3.15 on international law. So it's a very busy day today. Um, Yusuf Munayir will discuss the uh, various colonial narratives, not all of them, under the title Between Myth and Reality. And we will be addressing a number of these uh, most commonly used uh, narratives to address the uh, situation in Israel-Palestine, specifically in uh, the United States, but also way beyond. We will start with uh, a quick hello first. Kifa, how are you, Yusuf? Hi, Bassem. Thanks for having me. Hanging in there. Thank you for joining us, Yusuf. And uh, also, um, before I start, let me just say a few words about Yusuf. Yusuf Munayir is head of Palestine Israel program and senior fellow at Arab Center, Washington, D.C. He is also uh, serving as a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Palestine Studies and was previously executive director of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Some of his published articles can be found in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Nation, Boston Globe, uh, Foreign Policy, Journal of Palestine Studies, Middle East Policy, and others. Dr. Munayir holds a PhD in international relations and comparative politics from the University of Maryland. And I know a lot more than what is on this bio list, so we will be satisfied with this. Uh, Yusuf, you have been uh, everywhere uh, for a very long time on the question of Israel-Palestine. You are ubiquitous. You've been on um, mainstream television uh, repeatedly. You've been uh, writing in mainstream uh media as well as uh, the more independent media. And uh, I have been uh, very proudly following your work. And you have uh, also caught out uh, with me at George Mason University and other uh, places. We are very honored to have you and we will get right into it. Um, we are addressing the questions of um, narratives slash myths. And of course, we all have them. This is not something that's particular to any one actor. But today, it's important to address this given what is unfolding before us. I will start with asking you about the principal framework that you consider to be the interpretive lens of so much of what we encounter by way of uh, Israel's narratives regarding what is going on in Israel-Palestine. And I know from uh, following your work and reading your work that you uh, stress the, the question of Palestinians not being seen as a distinct people. So I'll let you expand on that, and then we'll go into the various uh, narratives that uh, we have uh, addressed in the announcement for this event. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Bassem, very much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity uh, to join you here. I very much appreciate it. Uh, and all the, the work that um, uh, you guys do to share information and educate people, especially in moments like this, it's so crucial. So very happy to um, participate uh, in this conversation. Uh, so I, I sort of want to begin with, um, you know, a, a bit of an explanation and sort of what I think are the, the, the underlying um, lenses, if you, if you will, um, through which a lot of these myths that we are going to talk about um, are understood and are created. Um, and I think there are two key ones um, that are uh, the most important to focus on and operate most often in the, the discourse around Palestine um, and uh, tend to be the most, uh, most destructive. Um, and so let me just say a word about what I mean by lens first. It's, it's, uh, when, I, when I say lens, I mean uh, sort of, um, um, you know, a, a set of uh, beliefs or ideas or understandings through which we look at a particular situation or a particular group of people. Um, and the, the two lenses that I want to talk about first are um, a colonialist lens, um, and also uh, a second, often overlapping, but uh, a distinct lens as well, which is an anti-Palestinian lens. 
Um, so let's let's discuss both of these one at a time and then talk a little bit about ways in which they can come together, right? Um, so when we talk about a colonialist, colonialist lens, this is something that, you know, we might be very familiar with. When I say we, I mean, you know, people who have any sort of understanding of um, colonial interaction um, will be familiar uh, with um, the ways in which uh, colonial narratives have understood uh, or described um, those who they are colonizing. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a lens that is filled with all kinds of stereotypes uh, and, uh, and falsehoods um, about indigenous populations. Um, and so just some examples uh, of these, um, you know, that the, the, the uh, indigenous people uh, are savages or they are barbaric or they are uneducated, or they are uh, filthy, uh, or they are um, uh, unwilling to participate in a civilized society, uh, or their culture is fundamentally uh, barbaric, so on and so forth. And, you know, for, for those of us who have an understanding of sort of um, colonial interactions, none of this is new. Um, and we see this operate a lot in the discourse um, around uh, Palestine. And um, uh, for those of us, again, who have seen this elsewhere, immediately sort of recognize it when it's at play in a uh, conversation around uh, Palestinians. Um, so this is sort of the colonialist lens. And I think it has long existed in Western discourse and understanding, not just of, of Palestine, of course, and not just of the region, but really in um, any place where the West has been a colonial power, which is much of the world. Um, uh, but it is, of course, at play uh, in uh, Palestine and in the Middle East and has been uh, so consistently throughout the West's interaction with, uh, with, with the region and continues through this day. So this is sort of the um, colonial, colonialist lens. And if we were to boil down this colonialist lens into a few words, it would simply be that they, they here being um, the indigenous population, are not people. They are not people. In other words, they are not like us, us being the, the colonizers. They are unequal to us. And they are of, of a fundamentally different class of beings uh, than the uh, superior colonizers. They are not people. Um, and the anti-Palestinian lens that I want to discuss here, which again, I think lies at the foundation of a lot of these myths and uh, oftentimes um, operates uh, in conjunction with this colonialist lens, um, can be boiled down uh, to um, a similar set of words, but is distinct. Um, it's not that they are not people, but that they are not a people. Uh, in other words, that they do not have a distinct and unified identity. Uh, they are different than other groups of peoples uh, who themselves have distinct uh, unified identities. Um, and of course, along with that, a uh, territorial identity <clears throat> and historical connection um, to, uh, to a particular territory as well. Um, and this is something that we see operating all the time in the discourse uh, as well, this anti-Palestinian lens, uh, which looks at Palestinians as specifically not a people. Um, and together, these two lenses, I think, uh, lie at the foundation of so much uh, of the uh, myths that are often taken as truth in Western discourse and understanding um, about Palestine and Palestinians, that they are inferior uh, as people, that they're not people themselves, uh, that they're lesser beings than uh, not just the Israelis, but also um, you know, people in, in the West, um, but also that they are not a people. Uh, they are not uh, distinct. Uh, they are not um, uh, real as a people. Their identity is sort of um, uh, uh, made up or, or superficial, um, and that they have no real uh, connection to, uh, to the land. 
Um, sometimes these lenses operate independently, uh, and oftentimes they operate um, to, uh, together. And we see a lot of that um, in uh, much of the, the conversation around uh, Palestine um, all the time. And of course, especially uh, in moments like the last uh, several weeks as there's been this horrific war uh, on the people in Gaza. Thank you, uh, Yusuf. We, we at this point uh, can uh, visit the various um, colonial narratives that you have uh, so kindly shared with me, uh, the uh, few points that uh, we can address uh, in this uh, very short session. Uh, we would like to start, or I'd like to start with the first one, which is the West is a good faith mediator. Uh, it is essentially something that uh, comes up, although after the recent assault on Gaza and the uh, almost unanimous support, at least early on, during the first three weeks, this might have been uh, shaken even in the eyes of those who or some of those who might have held this, but uh, it's still something that uh, is advanced, sometimes the aftermath as the case. So I'll let you address this. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's a couple of ways to sort of um, look at this. Uh, in, in the more recent period, you can look at this um, sort of as the role of Western powers uh, in, um, uh, you know, supposedly mediating between Israelis and Palestinians or mediating between Israelis and other Arab states in the different sort of um, moments or processes of negotiations that, that have taken place. Um, but in, in, a, in a bigger sense, um, I think it's, it's worthwhile to look at this sort of um, in you know, the, the historical context of the West's interaction uh, in the region. Um, and not just in the most uh, recent uh, period and in the period uh, since 1948. Um, you know, the, the idea that the, the West is somehow a benevolent and principled actor is, is belied by the historical record of the West pursuing its own imperial interests in the region. Uh, we see this not just in Palestine, of course, but throughout the region. Um, and there has always been, you know, this, um, um, uh, you know, the, the, this um, side by side uh, idea advanced uh, of sort of the West as a principled uh, mediator, while at the same time, it was very much pursuing its own imperial interests throughout uh, the region. Uh, when we look back, for example, historically at uh, the point in time where uh, the Ottoman Empire had collapsed after World War I, and the uh, West began to sort of uh, lay out its imperial uh, designs for uh, the region, dividing up the region uh, into uh, different mandates that would be controlled uh, by the British or by the French or what have you. Um, this was coming at the same moment uh, that the West was talking about the ideas of self-determination, uh, and the emancipation of, uh, of peoples um, and, uh, and so on. And so this, um, you know, th there's this duality that has, has constantly existed, uh, I think, throughout the West's interaction and, uh, with, with the region, which is itself, uh, you know, uh, supported by some of, some of, these, some of these myths. Um, uh, this uh, idea that, uh, you know, the, the West... Uh, is coming to civilize, right? Is coming to uh, help these people become nation states. And this is something that was, um, you know, written quite explicitly into the ideas of uh, the Western mandates that, um, you know, were, were created after the uh, Ottoman Empire, that these were supposed to be temporary political constructs that were supposed to help these sort of junior partners uh, to uh, independence so that we can help them sort of stand up on their their own feet as if that's 
you know, what, um, what, what colonialism is, is really uh, about. Um, so it's sort of, it's sort of always uh, been there and we, we see it through this day. Um, you know, we can uh, talk about, you know, every sort of historical juncture uh, and the ways in which Western powers have uh, operated within this duality of, um, you know, speaking about, um, uh, you know, principles and, and so on uh, at the same time that they're advancing their own uh, imperial interests. But most recently, I think, you know, we see this um, in the way that the United States is uh, handling uh, the uh, relationship with Israel uh, during this horrific war on, on the people of, of Gaza. Um, you see the president of the United States simultaneously talk about things like the need for uh, peace uh, and, um, uh, you know, Palestinians needing to have dignity and equality um, while um, supporting uh, in, a, in a blank check way um, the uh, Israeli government's uh, horrific war on, on the people of Gaza. Uh, and so this, there's been this consistent duality that um, persists precisely because I think there is a willingness to believe in these myths um, and to accept these uh, lenses as um, uh, honest ways to look uh, at the region. Um, and I think that under the least bit of, of scrutiny, they sort of, um, they sort of collapse. Um, and, you know, when we look at the different Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, and again, you know, we could do an entire seminar series uh, on each one of these, um, but whether uh, it's in the sort of post-48 period uh, and in the post-sort of uh, Oslo period, or even before that, uh, the role of uh, the West uh, has uh, consistently been uh, to support Zionist interests vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, the, the Arabs and then the, the Palestinians. Um, and, you know, you see that um, in the partition plan in 1947. You see that uh, in uh, the different negotiations that have taken place um, uh, since then. And you see that, in fact, through uh, today. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I would say about, um, about that piece. Let's move on to the next um, <clears throat> narrative that I think is, uh, is is pretty hefty, and this is about Arabs being rejectionists from the very beginning, from the 47 plan uh, until the recent Abraham Accords and everything in between. This is something that uh, you've addressed um, numerous times and i'd love to uh, get your take on it in as systematic way as you can within the time frame we have and i know that you want me to put up a map feel free to let me know when you want me to do that yeah i think this is one of those this is one of those important tropes that have really been uh, very very damaging and that's this idea of arabs as uh rejectionists um and what does that mean to be a rejectionist it it, it means to essentially reject something for the sake of rejecting something, not because it is unreasonable or unfair, um, but because um, it, it, you as a Arab in this case are incapable of being reasonable or fair because of who you are, because you are an Arab, because you are uh, once again being looked at through this colonialist lens of being um, uncivilized or incapable of being reasoned with, right? Um, and uh, because of this, uh, it logically follows that the only uh, language that you sort of understand is the language of force. And this is, this is again, the, the colonialist, colonialist lens uh, at play. Um, uh, but, you know, when one, when one looks at the reasons why um, Arabs and Palestinians over time have, quote, unquote, rejected uh, you know, different uh, offers or proposals that have been made. Um, it's because those offers and proposals have been uh, fundamentally uh, unfair and disadvantaging um, them. Uh, and so I think the, the you know, the, the, the best sort of uh, uh, example of this is the 1947 partition plan. And it kind of 
it lays at the foundation of this myth, right? And we hear it often. Um, well, you know, the Arabs and the Palestinians were offered a state in 1947 uh, and they rejected it. This is often something that we hear uh, as a uh, response uh, when uh, Palestinians speak about the ethnic cleansing of 1948. Uh, which uh, was uh, carried out uh, to create the, the modern state of Israel on some 78% uh, of the land uh, of Palestine. Um, and so we hear, well, you know, basically you had your chance and you unreasonable Arabs, you rejected it. Uh, and therefore you deserve whatever fate befell you, including the ethnic cleansing of the vast majority of, of the indigenous people of, of the land. Um, but when one looks at the 1947 partition plan um, and understands exactly uh, what was being proposed, um, it, it's hard for any objective observer to come away from looking at that um, with, uh, with, with the sense that the Arabs were being unreasonable uh, in, um, in rejecting this, this proposal. So I think it's worth kind of looking at this a little bit. Um, and I, I, you have the map up, right? Folks can see this map now. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in 1947, the United Nations, uh, the General Assembly, uh, passed this partition plan uh, to uh, uh, effectively create what they called uh, two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. Um, as, uh, you know, a, a way to sort of bring the British mandate to an end. The British had decided that they were going to be ending their mandate. Obviously, the uh, Zionist uh, movement wanted to create a state in Palestine. The indigenous population of, of Palestinians rejected uh, this movement because of what it uh, would mean for them. Uh, and uh, the international community um, and, and the United Nations um, this was their sort of response to address this issue. Uh, let's divide the country in this way. Um, so it's important to note that at this time, in the entirety of the territory, um, Palestinian Arabs make up some 70% uh, of the entire population. Um, this is in, in 1947 and on the eve really of the creation uh, of the uh, Israeli state in, in 1948. Um, and you can see here from this, from this map uh, the way that they wanted to sort of divide the land up. Um, the uh, blue, bluish green color is what they uh, wanted to designate as the Jewish state. And then the orange color is what they wanted to designate as the Arab state. Um, within the uh, uh, blue-green territory of the Jewish state, um, you have about 55% of the population would have been Jewish and 45% of the population would have been Palestinian Arab. Uh, however, some 90% uh, of the entire Jewish population would have been uh, encapsulated within this state. And so here already you see this, this principle, again, this, this uh, anti-Palestinian lens coming into play for, um, uh, for, the, for the Jewish people who were seen as a people, uh, the idea of uh, unity was seen as essential. Uh, but for Palestinians, uh, this was something that was readily dismissed. Palestinians were uh, people that did not need to be united in one space. Uh, and they could be divided across multiple spaces. So in this map here, you see um, several different political entities, the Arab state, the Jewish state, and then uh, around Jerusalem, uh, you see a separate entity which was supposed to be uh, a corpus separatum and one that was supposed to have a, a different sort of uh, status than being under the Arab state or the Jewish state. And so for the Palestinian Arab population, uh, you are now divided in three different political entities uh, as a product of uh, this, um, uh, this partition. Uh, this is not in any way a recognition of the people's right to self-determination. Um, it's an uh, implementation of their 
fragmentation. Um, moreover, if you look at the actual ways in which the lines are drawn, um, and this is, uh, if you zoom in a little bit, it becomes even, uh, even clearer. Um, you know, you have these, uh, these intertwined states um, basically connecting at these very narrow junctures, um, which raises some serious questions about how this logistically could actually operate. Um, and when you uh, zoom in, and I'm glad that you did, you'll see on the screen right um, on, on the coastline, there's a little bit of an orange speck there where Yaffa is. Uh, you could see on the, uh, on the map there. Uh, that was supposed to be part of the Arab state as well. And this was the largest uh, Palestinian city at the time, uh, the city of Yaffa. And so uh, that little um, enclave was supposed to be part of the uh, Arab state. And so if you're looking at this from the perspective of the population that makes up 70% of the land, and uh, it is being proposed to you that you are going to, your people are going to be divided into uh, at least three different political entities uh, and into nearly four different geographical spaces that are barely uh, adjacent to each other and in some cases not adjacent to each other at all. Um, again, when you make up the vast majority of the, the population here, um, you're going to look at this and say, this is absolutely ridiculous and we don't want to have anything to do with it, right? Um, but most, most people are fed this idea that Arabs somehow rejected a fundamentally fair partition in 1947. And it is, be, it is because they are rejectionists and because they are who they are as Arabs that they were incapable of, uh, of accepting it. Um, and this is just one example of many that we could talk about where both the political and the geographic um, uh, divisions uh, did not meet the basic needs of Palestinian stakeholders to be considered reasonable for the, for the population. Um, and those are ultimately the reasons why these things uh, were rejected, uh, not, uh, not because Arabs are somehow incapable of accepting reason, uh, but they were unwilling of uh, accepting uh, their, their fragmentation and oppression. Well, uh, well, thank you, Sif. Uh, that was a lot. And uh, perhaps we can focus on some junctures uh, after we uh, go through some of these uh, narratives first. Uh, the third item is very much an item of the day. And it is uh, in many ways... Uh, what the entire conflict right now is being reduced to, which is how hearts and minds were won over at some level, and that is the question of Hamas. But the particular narrative that we're going to address uh, isn't about what's happening right now. It's, it's more uh, broad, and it's about Hamas being an entity that cannot be negotiated with. And this will bring us back to, of course, uh, 2006 and seven, uh, and after, if, if not before, when a lot of the uh, experience on the record demonstrates the actual opposite. Uh, and it's important to go through this in a, in a meticulous way. So I'll let you, I'll let you lead the charge. Yeah, I mean, um, we hear a lot of this, and I, and I think while this is the topic of the day um, because of the, the current situation uh, in, uh, in Gaza, um, this is not new in the Palestine context, uh, and it's not limited to Hamas. Uh, for years before the existence of Hamas, um, Israel's position was that the PLO cannot be negotiated with. Um, and that they simply have nobody to talk to, and that the PLO as uh, an entity was one that they couldn't be expected to enter into negotiations with. 
Um, of course, we know that not only uh, was uh, uh, Israel uh, uh, ultimately willing to engage the PLO in negotiations, but they did, um, and they did for years. Um, and of course, uh, uh, similarly, they have negotiated with Hamas and are doing so right now, right? Uh, as, we, as we speak, as we record this episode, um, there uh, is a, a deal being executed that was negotiated between Israel and Hamas through third parties uh, for the uh, release of hostages um, and, um, uh, and, and for the release of Palestinians being held uh, in uh, Israeli prisons uh, as well. Um, and of course, this is not the first time that Israel and Hamas come to a negotiated uh, agreement. Um, and there is a long history of this uh, that, that goes back uh, over many years. Um, and uh, it doesn't only include, of course, uh, exchanges of prisoners, but also includes negotiations around ceasefires, uh, which we've seen uh, many times over. Um, so the historical record itself um, uh, lays bare the, 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 the falsehood of this idea that Hamas can't be uh, negotiated with. Um, the reason I think that this is an important, an important one to sort of point out, uh, and, um, and to, um, uh, and to scrutinize, um, is not just because of what it pretends for this moment, but also what it has meant historically and what it will mean for the future. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, this goes back to this idea uh, that Arabs are rejectionists, uh, that Arabs are incapable of reason, um, and that um, the only language that they understand is force. Uh, and for Israel, um, selling this notion about its adversaries, whether it's Hamas today or the PLO yesterday, is a effective way of removing any responsibility or onus from themselves on taking steps to create a peaceful coexistence with their neighbors. If they can say, well, what do you want me to do? Negotiate with Hamas? We can't negotiate with them. We're just going to have to keep on keeping on with what we're doing until magically a Palestinian partner sort of uh, exists uh, that we can uh, negotiate with. And until such time, um, we are going to continue occupying Palestinian territory, continue building settlements, and so on and so forth. And so this idea of, um, uh, of rejectionist adversaries, as adversaries you can't negotiate with or what have you, actually has a tremendous amount of political utility for the colonial project, uh, because it uh, affords them continued space to move forward with that project, point the finger at um, uh, those they are they are colonizing, um, and um, uh, you know uh, abdicate any responsibility uh, for um, ending uh, the the colonialist project and coming to some sort of agreement uh, with uh, with the Palestinians. Um, so. Again, uh, there are um, many different moments we can talk about, whether it was the negotiation of different ceasefires in 2008, 2012, 2014, um, and, and uh, in 2021 as well, where there have been negotiations between Israel and Hamas through third parties or through significant prisoner exchanges, uh, like the prisoner exchange we saw executed in 2011 uh, when uh, a deal was struck uh, to release a um, uh, Israeli soldier that was held captive in the Gaza Strip in exchange for over a thousand Palestinian prisoners, something that was negotiated over uh, months. And that makes it clear that negotiation is possible. Now, this is where it goes back to the um, uh, the sort of the anti-Palestinian lens that they are not a people. One of the things we often see operating when it comes to both Israeli policy and U.S. policy towards Palestinians is the United States and Israel 
feel that they have a right to shape Palestinian leadership in ways that suit their interests. We hear this now, um, even today, uh, where uh, the United States and its partners and Israel talk about a future in Gaza that doesn't include Hamas. Who are the United States and Israel to determine for the Palestinian people who their leaders are going to be? Uh, the Palestinians don't get to determine who America's leaders are. They don't get to determine who Israel's leaders are. Um, and yet there is this, uh, there is this sense of an, an entitlement, which I believe goes back to this anti-Palestinian lens, that they are not a people. If you recognize the peoplehood of the Palestinians and you recognize their right to self-determination, um, you must recognize their right to choose their own leaders. But this is something that the West does not recognize and actually makes, a pre, makes as a precondition for engaging in any sort of negotiations with the, uh, with the Israelis that are mediated by the Americans. Uh, we uh, saw this with the way in which Israel did not negotiate with the PLO until the PLO uh, itself changed its positions. We saw that with the way that the United States reacted to the election of Hamas in 2006, um, uh, when it uh, you know, put sanctions on them and so on. Um, and we see this today, uh, where you hear the United States and Israel talk about needing to reform the Palestinian Authority and have a new Palestinian leadership before any other uh, change uh, can happen. Um, that's before we move on to the next point, if you don't mind, can we, because this is important, uh, uh, a lot of people listening are going to immediately think about, uh, reasons or rationales for why, uh, these claims are made on behalf of Israel or the United States regarding Hamas, uh, and they would cite, uh, its actual behavior. And I know this is not something that is directed only uh, uh, towards Hamas, it's always been the narrative, reg almost, re almost regardless of behavior. But if 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 this is the retort, how do we unpack this? How do we unpack this idea that uh, these claims are made not to speak on behalf of a people of a people, but to actually uh, cite uh, their dis quote unquote disruptive slash violent slash you know uh, fill in the blanks role? Well, there's no there's no doubt that their behavior uh, has often been violent. Uh, they uh, believe in armed resistance as a path towards uh, liberation. Um, so did the PLO uh, at, uh, at one point. Um, so did the Israelis at one point. Uh, and they still continue to use uh, uh, arms to advance uh, their, uh, their objectives. Um, this, is, this is not unique to Hamas in any way. What I think is important here to understand is if, if you are genuinely seeking a peace agreement built on negotiations. What is required is represent, representative leadership of the stakeholders that are involved in these negotiations. So if the idea is you want a peace agreement that will actually um, hold, right, and be stable and be secure, it needs to be something that is agreed to by both sides. Um, and to do that, you need leaders from both sides that are actually representative of the, of the peoples and the interests on their respective sides. Um, and the Western approach um, to Palestinian leadership has been uh, to shape a Palestinian leadership that will participate in negotiations that suits the interests of Israel while ignoring the interests of Palestinians. Um, and this is the sort of path that the, um, that the uh, PLO and the Palestinian Authority uh, went down through the Oslo process. And it has created a tremendous crisis of legitimacy for the Palestinian Authority because Palestinians see them as being more interested in the security of Israelis than the liberation of Palestinians. Of course, this is tied to the security collaboration that was a uh, requirement of the uh, Oslo uh, Accords. Um, and this has created a situation where you don't have a Palestinian leadership that has legitimacy among the population that would be necessary to come to any sort of agreement. Um, and so instead, you have this stagnation. 
which is uh, manipulated and taken advantage of by the most powerful player in the space, which is the Israelis, uh, who use that um, uh, who, who who use that sort of that status quo to advance again their their colonial project, continuing to entrench the occupation and expand settlements and force Palestinians off of more and more of their land. Um, so, if if we are serious about this idea of a negotiated peace, we must make a precondition for that representative leadership. Now, again, as I said, Palestinians don't get to choose who Israeli leaders are. Uh, there are no shortage of Israeli leaders who don't recognize uh, the rights of Palestinians, who don't uh, agree to the idea of Palestinian self-determination, who believe that the entirety of the territory uh, within what they call the land of, of Israel um, is uh, the exclusive right uh, of the uh, Jewish people. And yet Palestinians are expected to sit down at the negotiating table with those leaders. And I actually think that if you are ever going to have a negotiated solution, you have to meet Palestinians and Israelis where they are. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Uh, but what we are seeing today is the product of trying to shortcut this, trying to shortcut this by shaping Palestinians into what suits Israeli interests instead of allowing Palestinians to represent what Palestinians actually want um, and aspire to. All right. Um... Let's move on to the next item, which is a very important and uh, salient one. Uh, the idea that Palestinian calls for freedom are genocidal, especially in reference to certain uh, phrases, words, and so on. Uh, this is something that has actually uh, caused people to be canceled, fired, um, reprimanded, uh, uh, and so on. This is not something that uh, in my lifetime in the United States has been used in this particular manner uh, or weaponized in this manner, but recently it has. Even, um, even the ADL uh, simply stated that some of these phrases, which I'll let you address, uh, were just I mean, phrases they disagreed with and thought that they were, uh, you know, incorrect, uh, on the wrong side of history and so on. But now all of a sudden, this is uh, ground for uh, basically criminalizing this uh, behavior or, or, or these words and, and taking action as a result. So if you can address this uh, idea of Palestinian calls for freedom are actually genocidal. Yeah, I think, and, and there's, a, there's a few calls here that I, that I want to, to talk about, um, that, and they, they, you know, are, are all more or less treated the, the same way, uh, and the ways in which they are, are marginalized and, uh, considered, um, sort of existential threats or genocidal or annihilationist or what have you. Um, so I think most of us by now have, um, become familiar with the, um, uh, you know, controversy over, uh, the protest chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Um, I've written extensively about... What, um, what was of, that? What was from that the term? river to the sea, Palestine will be free. So uh, what, what, what is that slogan? So the river, of course, is the uh, Jordan River and the sea is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this is a territory that encompasses what Palestinians call home. Uh, or the land of Palestine. Uh, obviously, others have different names for this same space. Uh, the uh, Israelis call it Eretz Israel, or the land of Israel, right? Which is different, by the way, than the state of Israel. Uh, the state of Israel today uh, sits on 78% of that territory. Uh, but Eretz Israel, or the land of Israel, the, the, the space which the current Netanyahu government says uh, is the space that Jewish people have an exclusive right to is the entirety of the space. Um, and I believe they include in that as well, not just the land between the river and the sea, but also Syrian territory in the Golan Heights uh, as well. Um, so, uh, you know, Palestinians who call for freedom, for a free Palestine between uh, the river and the sea, uh, are uh, recently, and this, you're, you're right to note that this is something that has changed in recent years, 
uh, being called, uh, you know, genocidal or annihilationist uh, because uh, of this. Um, I, I've, as I said, I've written extensively about uh, what I believe the spirit behind uh, this call is. Uh, it is a rejoinder to the fragmentation of, of Palestinians um, who exist across the entirety of this space uh, and have existed across the entirety of this space uh, for centuries, um, and, um, uh, struggle within this space against a, uh, a common oppression, uh, which is an oppression of discrimination, uh, and occupation at the hands of the, uh, Israeli state. Um, and so when Palestinians say, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, um, it, in, in, in my view, what they are responding to is the fact that it is Palestinians who are not free in this space. And in fact, they are not free within this space. Um, I, I want to, to talk about a couple of other things uh, that uh, are similarly framed this way, because Be I think it... Before we move to the second... Uh, yeah. So uh, th this is actually uh, uh, critical. When people address this, there is this notion that it is beyond any shadow of a doubt that while we can argue about Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, Palestinian citizens of Israel are viewed as complete citizens and then all the tropes that, you know, that are nauseating about how they are freer than anywhere else in the world. And there's this, um, there are all these examples that are provided that they're in parliament, they're in various uh, institutions and so on. So when somebody talks about from the river to the sea and addresses the West Bank and Gaza, the response is always that, is that, well, you know, you can't consider Palestinians citizens of Israel as not being free and th so, so this is this is also one of the comebacks of at least a portion that that actually thinks about this from from the side that addresses this phrase as problematic yeah and i actually what i wanted to get to is is something that addresses just this right um uh to to explain why um uh why why that really doesn't make sense as a uh, sort of uh as a sort of response um, the idea that uh, you know that that slogans uh, are are genocidal or even principles are genocidal because they um, uh, you know call for the rights of, of Palestinians is not limited to this slogan of "From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free." Um, if you uh, look even at Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, including members of the Israeli Knesset, okay. Several years ago, they uh, proposed legislation in the Israeli parliament, in the Knesset, uh, that would make Israel a state of all its citizens. This was, this was the proposal, okay? Because currently, uh, Israel is not a state of all uh, its citizens. It's a Jewish state, right, uh, in which some non-Jewish citizens exist and are tolerated as citizens, but not nationals. Um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel who advanced this legislation in the supposedly democratic and tolerant and pluralistic state of Israel uh, had their proposal rejected from even being discussed in the Knesset because it was considered extremist and annihilationist. And the Israeli Supreme Court uh, agreed with the decision of the Knesset uh, as well. So when, when we are hearing these things being characterized as annihilationist or genocidal, it's important to understand what is meant by that, right? The idea of equality is considered an existential threat. We're not talking about violence, right? We're talking about equality before the law. Even equality before the law is considered an existential threat to the Israeli state. So when, when these things are called annihilationist, it is uh, 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 an effort to distract from what they are really calling for. Because the, the idea that equality is an existential threat is nonsense. 
to whom is inequality an existential threat other than inequality, right? Um, and so if we look, for example, at Jim Crow, Alabama, or if we look at apartheid South Africa, uh, Alabama did not cease to exist because of the end of Jim Crow policies. Uh, South Africa did not cease to exist because of the end of apartheid policies. Um, but from the Israeli perspective, equality itself is an existential threat. And so it's not just in from the river to the sea that we hear this sort of uh, claim that Palestinian calls are annihilationist deployed. Um, it is in any calls for Palestinian rights uh, and to equality and to freedom um, within this space. Look again at, for example, at the BDS call. The same thing, the same charges are levied against the BDS call, right? And that's because the BDS call says we want an end to the occupation. Uh, we uh, want um, uh, a right of return for Palestinian refugees in line with international law. And we want equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel. Those, those three things are considered an existential threat to Israel precisely because Israel's existence as they see it is dependent on a system of inequality. And so it's very important for us to push back against these kind of claims because they are aimed specifically uh, at distracting from the core issue here, which is the system of discrimination. Uh, and uh, I believe that as this system of discrimination uh, has become more entrenched, uh, as the prospect for some kind of negotiated and peaceful solution has become more and more remote, uh, and as the violence that is wrought upon Palestinians by the Israeli state has become more and more extreme, it's become necessary to distract more than ever from this fundamental problem of injustice. Because the more people start to ask questions about it, um, the easier it, it, it sort of collapses. And so uh, we are hearing now that any call for equality for Palestinians is genocidal and therefore should not even should not be listened to. People who chant it should be uh, criminalized. Uh, student groups uh, who uh, organize around this principle should be shut down and so on. Um, and this is part of a, a growing sort of trend in Israeli strategy uh, of uh, repression. Uh, and I think that this is um, a really important characteristic of, of where we are today and something that's going to define a lot of the of the years to come. All right, let's move to the last um, narrative, which uh, also has affected the lives of so many, not just in the United States, but uh, probably all around, notably in Europe. And it's essentially the um, the weaponization of anti-Semitism, and then of course the idea that anti-Semitism smears are in good faith. If you can address that, this is something that uh, uh, all of us have uh, experienced at a micro level. If we uh, even write something on social media, let alone like a major treatise or an article and uh, it involves critique of the policies of the state of Israel. And in response, um, it has become so easy, uh, almost almost like uh, a license recently, recently after this fall, after October 7th, a license to criminalize and and uh, I'll, I'll plug uh, something that uh, is coming out shortly uh, uh, that my my colleague and friend Sinan Antunin and I have written um, about this open license to criminalize. Uh, so if you can address that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, look, this is um, this is not a coincidence that it's happening. This is by this is by design. Um, and I, I want to ex explain what I mean by that. But first, I think it's important to note anytime we talk about this issue that um, anti-Semitism is real. 
Um, it's not uh, it's not a joke. Um, uh, it is a, a form of, of racism and bigotry that uh, has a real impact on people's lives, um, and it needs to be uh, combated uh, in good faith, um, just as all forms of, of bigotry and racism uh, should be. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a cynical weaponization of anti-Semitism that is real as well. Um, and uh, I want to, to talk a little bit about how that has developed uh, over time and is also part of a very specific um, Israeli government uh, strategy and a strategy on the part of supporters of the Israeli government and their policies uh, as well. Um, you know, if, if one goes back uh, in time to uh, the first intifada, um, it was a, a, a really massive uh, moment in the world. Um, apartheid in South Africa was being challenged. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, was uh, collapsing. Um, and suddenly it felt like all kinds of change uh, was possible. Um, and for uh, the Israelis, there was uh, a, a great degree of fear uh, that... Um, people will look at the Palestinians who are rising up and begin to question what Israel is doing um, and put pressure uh, on Israel to uh, join this new world uh, order uh, of, uh, of, uh, of democratic change and what have you, um, and uh, finally uh, uh, agree to peace with, uh, with the Palestinians. Um, and it was in this context that, uh, you know, the, um, the Oslo process began, the first through Madrid uh, and then Oslo. And negotiations uh, with the Palestinians had a strategic utility uh, for the Israelis. The strategic utility in the negotiations was not that it was actually going to lead to a uh, long-lasting uh, and, and conflict-ending uh, negotiated resolution with the Palestinians. Uh, but that it was a, it, it was it was a strategic utility in that it uh, prevented international pressure on Israel to change its policies, because so long as there was a horizon for peace, as long as you were able to say, well, we're working on it, we're going to get there. There's a vision, right? There's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, people couldn't really come and say, well, you need to do more because you're already doing something. Right. So the negotiations were a strategic utility in that sense. When what everybody understood as as a negotiated process effectively collapsed in uh, early uh, uh, 2000s um, and the uh, violent repression of the second um, uh, intifada was, um, uh, you know, on, on display for the entire world, this specter of having to deal with international opprobrium rose again for Israel. Um, and it was within this moment uh, that you didn't really see a uh, resumption of significant negotiations, um, but you saw instead a failure of the international community to make that happen in a meaningful way. And uh, what took its place uh, is a global civil society effort uh, to demand for accountability. Um, and this uh, took the shape uh, of the uh, Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions in 2005. For the Israelis at the outset, um, you know, this was not a significant concern. Uh, but over time, particularly as it became more and more clear uh, that its um, uh, in, uh, apartheid system was entrenching, uh, more and more people around the world uh, were beginning to get involved in efforts to demand accountability uh, for uh, Israel's treatment of Palestinians, uh, including through uh, efforts at boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, and uh, you know, around uh, the uh, you know around 2010, uh, this became sort of a, um, uh, a priority of the Israeli government to respond to this global movement for accountability. And one of the ways that they initially tried to respond to this movement uh, was through, you know, what they would call Hasbara or explanation or propaganda, 
to uh, essentially try to explain or defend the policies uh, that uh, people around the world were increasingly critical of. Uh, what they found, though, is that that wasn't very effective, uh, that people were not really buying these explanations, um, and that despite their efforts to try to defend these policies, um, the global movement for accountability uh, was growing and growing significantly. Um, around 2015, they decided that they had to switch gears uh, and that this approach of trying to defend their policies from critics uh, was not successful. Instead of defending their policies, um, uh, what they need to do is attack the critics. And so they went on, on what they would call an offensive strategy instead of a defensive one against global civil society dissent. Uh, this took the shape not just of um, a policy pronouncement, but it took the shape of government machinery as well in the form of a government agency dedicated to this very purpose, um, which uh, in October of, of 2015 uh, was um, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Um, and in its mandate, uh, it, it was uh, not just to combat uh, the global boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, but also to involve like-minded, non-governmental partners around the world in this effort, because they understood that um, they were going to be seeking these repressive outcomes when they attacked their critics in other countries, not in Israel. And so they needed the help of others in those countries to advance those objectives. Um, and the principle that they followed uh, was this idea that it takes a network, not just the government on its own, but a network uh, of uh, like-minded partners to advance these objectives. And it started with things like anti-BDS laws, uh, and people, uh, if you're not familiar with it, there are laws on the books today uh, in a number of countries, in a number of states here in the United States, uh, which try to criminalize or otherwise marginalize uh, boycotts. Now, the problem that they ran into with this um, is that, uh, you know, we have something here in, in the West called freedom of expression laws. Um, particularly in the United States, we have a fairly robust First Amendment, um, which our Supreme Court had previously decided protects the right to boycott. Um, and so one of the challenges that they found with pushing for anti-BDS laws as a way to sort of attack their critics uh, was that they were running into the First Amendment, that these First Amendment challenges um, really... Uh, slowed this effort and in some ways made it counterproductive because it started to rally to the Palestinian cause people who were First Amendment defenders and who weren't necessarily interested in the Palestinian cause before that. When you have, you know, white newspaper owners in Arkansas uh, getting targeted by these anti-BDS laws, um, even though they had nothing to do with Palestine before that, um, it, it starts to wake people up to what this is all about. So we started to see a shift in this strategy in response to running into the First Amendment. And that was an effort not to stop attacking critics using the law, but to use different law to attack the critics and uh, do so in a way that circumvented the First Amendment. And the way that that was done was by redefining criticism as discrimination. And this is where the anti-Semitism piece comes in. Because discrimination is not protected by the First Amendment. So if you can cast or portray criticism of Israel as discrimination, you can then hijack and redirect anti-discrimination law, existing anti-discrimination law, against critics without running into the First Amendment. And so this is the approach that, um, that this, this network, this government-backed network, um, really gravitated towards 
as these anti-BDS laws were being challenged on First Amendment grounds. And we saw a growth in these efforts to advance definitions of anti-Semitism that would essentially be sweeping definitions that would um, define much Palestinian speech uh, as anti-Semitic. Uh, and the, the point of this uh, was to try to use as much of existing law as possible uh, and if needed pass new law uh, to use the state to target dissenters. And we are seeing it today. We're seeing it with student groups who are being shut down uh, by orders of, of the governor, for example, in Florida. Uh, we're seeing it uh, uh, with universities who are being sued uh, by uh, some of these lawfare groups uh, who allege uh, that by allowing you know, pro-Palestine activity, this is fundamentally discriminatory towards Jewish students, right? And all of this rests on this shift, this characterization of Palestinian speech as discrimination, as anti-Semitism, so that uh, they can circumvent First Amendment protections. Um, and uh, you know, I think, as I, as I said, this is this is going to characterize a lot of the years uh, to come, because as as the state of Israel becomes harder and harder to defend because of its actions, its supporters are going to lean further and further into repression as a tactic to silence dissent. In line with uh, what you're sharing, uh, and I know that we all know what a certain phenomenon would look like when you actually encounter it, which is in this case, anti-Semitism, or as I shared, we know, for instance, what Islamophobia or, or other uh, sorts of uh, uh, forms of racism look like, what would uh, cross the line in terms of uh, the critique of the state of Israel into anti-Semitism as, as an example of what is indeed uh, not acceptable and, and, and abhorrent and, and so on as, as being racist? Well, I think one of the one of the problems is the definitions of anti-Semitism that are being pushed, right? Um, uh, you know, as 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 these repressive devices are often intentionally vague, precisely because they can have a greater repressive effect when they are vague. Um, so I'll just give you I'll just give you an example of this. So if you look at, for example, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, this definition that has kind of become the one that the supporters of this repressive approach have gravitated towards as the primary instrument of, of, um, of uh, enshrining, um, you know, uh, this definition of, of, of anti-Semitism and weaponizing it. It, it. it gives us an example of anti-Semitism denying Israel's right to exist. Right? What does that mean? Well, um, for Palestinian citizens of Israel who uh, call for equality before the law, uh, as far as Israel is concerned, uh, this is uh, denying the right of Israel to exist. And so even calls for equal rights in Israel uh, become anti Semitic. Um, if you call for the right of return for Palestinian refugees, something that is enshrined, of course, in international law, uh, that is uh, uh, often deemed as denying the right of Israel to exist because implied in that uh, uh, you know, definition of Israel's right to exist is a right to a perpetual uh, ethnic majority. And so the idea that Palestinians have a right to return challenges that idea of a perpetual ethnic majority and therefore challenges this right of Israel to exist. So therefore, uh, Palestinians returning to their homes becomes anti-Semitic, right? If you have a map of Palestine, uh, which includes the territory from the river to the sea, uh, and you have that on your Facebook page or on your social media account or what have you, uh, that can be considered an act of anti-Semitism in line with this definition, even if 
um, you know, the the uh, the inverse of that, right? Uh, a map of 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 Israel across that entire space is not considered an anti-Palestinian racist act, right? Um, so the the vagueness of some of these examples enhance its repressive effect because if you can make the claim that such a thing is anti-Semitic, well, at that point you need to investigate, right? So so if you have, for example, let's say a university that adopts this definition, right, uh, of anti-Semitism, uh, and uh, and and you know a, a student group has a map of of Palestine. Well, maybe that maybe that is seen as denying Israel's right to exist. Maybe not. But since they've adopted this definition within their guidelines around discrimination, now they have to investigate that student group, right? Uh, they have to uh, they have to punish that student group, or they have to suspend that student group, or what have you. Um, and so the vagueness itself enhances the repressive effect because it isn't really clear as to what is and what isn't anti-Semitism. Um, and uh, it tries to be as expansive as possible, precisely so it sweeps up as many critics uh, of Israel as uh, it can. What would be uh, what would be uh, your your assessment and judgment about how all of these narratives are? prevalent, especially in certain spaces, because of the power disparity? I mean, do the more powerful, do more powerful parties have the capability of not just producing, you know, narratives and myths, because everyone does, but making, do they have the ability and capability to make them stick? Is, is this something that is part of why we are witnessing what we are witnessing? Uh, and how much of it also has to do with the proximity of Israel to the United States politically? Yeah, I mean, the, the power dynamic has so much uh, to do with it. I mean, part of it is because of already pre-existing biases, uh, including, you know, the co colonial lens that we talked about, which is not just about Palestinians, but about so many other people. Um, but, but these sort of anti-Palestinian um, uh, myths find traction here because of that the, that pre-existing racism and and bigotry. Um, but of course, the power disparity has so much to do with it. I mean, you have to remember at the end of the day, we are, are, are talking between Israel and the Palestinians, a, a state uh, and, and a stateless people, right? Um, and the and 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 the the imbalance that that comes with that is is replicated over and over and over again in many different spaces. Um, you know, you have just at the at, at the government level, uh, you have um, Israeli government ministries that are dedicated solely uh, to providing public information, right? To providing uh, propaganda, uh, to uh, building diplomatic relations, uh, to building relationships with media outlets and so on and so forth. There is no you know, there, there, there is no balance to that on the Palestinian side because you don't have a functioning uh, state, let alone a state with the same level of uh, capacity to do the same. And it's magnified, of course, by the fact that, yes, Israel does have a pre-existing relationship with the West, and there are a number of pro-Israel voices in the West uh, as well, supportive of these messages as well, within the Western space. These include Jewish Zionist individuals and groups, but also non-Jewish Zionist groups and individuals as well here in the United States. As we know, um, probably most Zionists here in the United States are not Jewish at all. They're probably Christian evangelicals. Um, and so, yes, this, you know, um, uh, this has a lot to do with the persistence of these uh, myths, the prevalence of them, um, uh, and it, it is something that, you know, continues to, I think, expand this gap often over time uh, because of that, uh, that power imbalance, especially in moments like this, especially in moments like this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yusuf. We, uh, we might have to stop here because we have abused your generosity. Uh, it's been uh, 
75 minutes and uh, this is one of the perhaps i think the only teaching so far our eighth teaching where it's only one person so uh very much appreciate your time and um and effort and uh uh sensitivity uh and knowledge we uh will of course be continuing these teachings uh, we have another, let me just share very quickly. We have another, uh, this afternoon at 3.15, another teaching under the title of uh, International Law and the War in Palestine uh, with uh, Richard Falk, Daryl Lee, and Nora Arakat. It's moderated by Lisa Hajjar and myself. It's at 3.15 p.m. EST, 10.15 Palestine time. And uh, Professor Falk will address why international law matters, even when not implemented. Daryl Lee will address genocide rules. Noura Arakat would address a chronic crisis of accountability. See you then at 3.15 this afternoon. And Yusuf Munayir, you've been uh, Munayir, which is actually enlightening uh, in Arabic. Uh, Yusuf is head of Palestine Israel program and senior fellow at Arab Center, Washington, D.C., and he has taught at various area universities, including uh, George Mason University. Uh, again, this is a um, collaborative teaching series with 22 university centers and research centers that have come together uh, in the week after October 7th to put together these teachings. We actually also have um, all of the teachings, as well as the uh, War on Palestine podcast, as well as an archive of solidarity statements, as well as um, developing a, a resource module, all can be found on palestineincontext.org, palestineincontext.org. And you will also be able to find announcements for upcoming events. We have a media and the uh, war on uh, teaching uh, coming up next week. We also have another on Know Your Rights, uh, which has to do with campus activism and beyond. And we do uh, intend to uh, continue this series on narratives with a specific emphasis on particular junctures. Uh, Yusuf, I will leave the last words for you if you have any, and uh, then we will adjourn. I just want to say thank you all very much, uh, Bassem, for, for doing this and for everyone who uh, stuck along with it. Um, and I look forward to checking out the, the sessions you have later on. Absolutely. Uh, and I will be in touch with you uh, in case we are going to try to abuse your time a bit more. Thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks to all of the um, various institutions that collaborated to produce this and uh, to all of the people the unknown soldiers that have made this happen, the biggest thanks always go to you. Shukran Yusuf, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon under better circumstances. Inshallah. Thanks, Bessam. Take care.